begin, and I am back with speaker Carolyn Tai. She is a counselor and art therapist. Welcome back, Caroline. Thanks for having me back again. Ready to talk more art and therapy together. Yes, it's like two of my favorite things, really, talking and art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you love big emotions too. I do. So you must love the therapy part too. I do. I do. All of it together is fantastic. So, so I do want to ask you though, what happens as a parent if let's say it's not even during art therapy, let's say it's at school and my kid comes home and they have kind of an aggressive or maybe an inappropriate drawing that they've created. What should I do with that and how do I react? I... I think the first thing is, and I took a big sigh there, <laughs> like, oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, the big question is because I think oftentimes we don't, we overreact when we see something like that. And so um, having a sort of really like deep breath. So even as myself, like I remind myself as a parent to take a deep breath before I engage in it and kind of like slow myself down because innately we get scared or, um, we get um, unsure or there's some sort of response that we're having, right? That the image is kind of making us feel uneasy. So I say, check yourself first as a parent. Um, why is this making me upset? Can I take a deep breath? And then can I ask my child about the image, right? Um, and whether it's coming from a school district that's saying, hey, someone created your little one, uh, John created this interesting image in class. What are we going to do with it? Or it comes home in their file and you open it up be like whoa um I would say first ask your child about it right like where is it coming from oh I see this image you know start to have that curiosity and that questioning for them um, I see that you made this image can you tell me more about it and start to understand it and and not to be afraid of the image but want to engage in the image so oftentimes we get very afraid of something it, it could be because it's from um a Roblox game, right? So we all know that the kids are obsessed with video games. Where is it coming from? Maybe they're talking about something in soci so um, history. I can't even say the other thing. History that's bringing up some sort of war. You know, where is this sort of like imagery coming from? And to not just be so quick to judge it, but to learn about it and understand it a little bit more. That reaction is. Yeah, our parenting wanting to fix things reactions <laughs> aren't necessarily always the, the right decision so yeah, yeah investigating it sounds like is what you're suggesting yeah just come to it with a little bit of curiosity to understand where the image is coming from and I would say on both ends right like the fix it person, you know, because we all have our parenting styles, the fix it person. And then the person that's like, oh my God, I don't want to touch this. I'm just going to fold it up and not look at it. That's not the right parenting move either. Maybe, you know, like, so there's got to be that delicate balance in between. Like, let's, let's know that it exists. Let's put it out there in the open um, and make sure that it doesn't feel like shameful or guilty for making that image. It might be um, some sort of self um, expression that needs to be um, handled. Yeah. Yeah. And I would have never thought about having a class that was talking about some violent, traumatic thing that kind of resonates in the child's mind and they were trying to process it too. Yeah. That's, or maybe they saw something on the way to school that you didn't know about or who knows. Yeah. And I mean, not to date anything, right. But like in the world of this pandemic, right. We are all dealing with this collective trauma. And so maybe the image is, is meant for self-expression. Maybe it's not like a um, red flag, but maybe it is a red flag. So you always want to make sure that you, you do address it and you don't just kind of let it hang out. So what if I want to encourage my child to draw art and to be more artistic at home? What can I do to encourage that? The first thing I think about is environment. So how do we set up a space that is creatively and uh, welcoming, um, making sure that there's a space where they feel like they can make a little bit of a mess. They they can pull out their crayons or their markers or some Play-Doh and clay. Um, make it easy access for your child. Um, teach them how to put it away properly. Teach them how to use those materials so that you feel like, oh, I don't want to. 
I can only speak for myself. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want Leo to paint today because I don't want to have to clean it up, you know? <laughs> and instead of just feeling that way so that they don't get to do anything creative, teach them how to actually engage in, in, in a way that is um, effective and healthy for both of you as the parent and as the child. So really set up your space to be creative. Um, also, you know, set up your space where art is in all around you. Like, you know, do you have artwork up in the home? Do you um, make sure that you have sculptures so that they can feel inspired? Um, and then the third one is model it, right? Go sit down with your child. Um, don't make it have to just be a solo thing. You can art make um, and you can see what your child will talk about. Um, and you can even get the benefits of the art process in itself um, with your child in hand. Uh, we have all those like adult coloring books, right? They're not really technically therapy, but coloring does show that it reduces anxiety. So sit down and color with your kid. Um, it will also help you as a parent too. My mom, when we were little, um, she used to have us, we called them add-ons. So we would draw like a shape and then we would add on and switch back and forth between the two of us. And I always thought that was so fun because it ended up being something completely different. No matter how hard you tried to make it one thing, it would get shifted. But it was like a time where we would kind of talk and create something and then talk about what we created. Yeah. And you made it kind of a game, right? So it's like, how do you make, make creativity also like this like fun and interesting game too um, so that they feel like they're not sitting down and doing art class. They're actually engaging in something very different and playful. Yeah. Now I, I hesitate to tell you this because I don't want my listeners to think I'm a terrible person, but you'll appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> tell me you're not a terrible person. <laughs> So when my kids were really little, there were, we lived in an area that had a lot of cement. And so the worms would come up when it was wet out. And so one day I had this brilliant idea of taking watercolor and putting them in really low trays. And so we would dip the worms really quick, put them on the piece of paper and the worms would crawl across the paper. And then we'd wash the worm off and put it back. And we just kept rotating. And um, my youngest was probably, I think she was two. And my older one was would have been five, or actually four and a half-ish. Um, but anyway, they would spend so much time that I would actually have to sometimes take the worms away because I was worried the worms were going to die from over, over watercolor exposure. <laughs> but it was fun. It was I relaxed. I love it. And no one should think you're a bad person. That's like the creative way of like working with kids, right? Like, what do they love? They love being out in the mud. They like getting messy. Like the, when I talk about like in the last little segment, I talked about being a relational therapist, right? So we have to learn what our children love and we have to get to know each and every one of them because they're different too, but you know that they love that. And so they had fun and they were engaged and I'm sure they loved playing in the mud too. They did. Oh, they did. Yeah. And talk about a mess. You know, you come back in and there's watercolor and worm stuff and mud, <laughs> but you know, yeah. it cleans up. It's fine. It's not that big a deal in the long run. Yes. And what a beautiful statement to like for kids to know that it's not that big a deal, right? The mess isn't always so bad. Like we can just clean it up. Um, and right now, a lot of our children struggle with sensory issues. And I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but really no. quickly, they struggle from sensory issues because we don't let them get messy and they're on technology all day long. So um, getting them to expose into finger paints and Play-Doh and mud and dirt and all of that stuff allows them to just be kids um, and to be okay with mess. Uh, that's a really great point is the sensory piece of that too, because we don't think about that. You're right. It's we we're hand sanitizing everything. We're masking up. We're doing all this stuff to to prevent us from getting and feeling right. Yeah. 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 That's that's kind of sad. I never thought of it that way, but that's it's very true. Yeah. So we'll have lots of work as parents. Yeah. <laughs> we need more worms, Caroline. Need more worms. <laughs> we need buckets and buckets of worms and watercolors to kind of save our. Save our souls a little bit, I think. <laughs> uh, I will say, though, you know, when, when they would spend time doing something art-wise, it wouldn't matter what mood they were in before. It calmed them down. You know, they were focused on something that was 
outside of what they were feeling at, you know, when, when they started at least and yeah. kind of find yeah. the flow that just, you could talk to them, you could spend time and, and get through some of the things that maybe you wouldn't normally be able to get into. Art, it, it inherently has a, a therapeutic quality, right? So as an art therapist, I'm looking at so many things. I'm looking at the resulting artwork. I'm looking at how they make their art. I'm looking at the materials. I'm looking at the age development of the child. I'm looking at the history of trauma and all of those things. Like I'm taking all that in as an art therapist, but you know, inherently art is therapeutic and we've known that for centuries we've told stories on caves like we've needed to weave baskets we've needed to dress ourselves so that we look different so art's always been a part of our background and we've known that it kind of like soothes our soul um we just have to kind of help our kids stay with it and stick with it too so as a parent how would you know first of all that your child needs some sort of therapy Second, that art therapy would be a good choice. And then when would you know that they were, quote unquote, done with therapy part of art? Yeah. So it's different for obviously all kids, right? So the done part um, is an evolving process. So I have worked with for a while and we take pauses from therapy and then something bothers them again and they'll come back. Um, but saying that your child needs therapy um, typically I think is... Um, you see a community maybe telling you, right? Like a teacher is saying they're struggling at school or a grandparent or yourself. You're just feeling like something isn't right with my kid. I feel like there's no harm in um, saying that we need to talk with a professional, right? And we're teaching kids that it's okay to get help for something that's bothering us and to have a support system outside of our own family. Uh, so when you're starting to feel that, you're starting to notice their behaviors are different. You're starting to notice that they, um, maybe something's shifting at school, maybe something's shifting at home. Then you want to start looking for like a, another professional. Um, art therapy is good for, I think, most people, most kids. But of course, I'm biased to it because I love it so much. Um, but you really want to find really the good fit for your child in therapy. So it doesn't always matter how they're doing therapy. It kind of matters the person that's doing therapy and to make sure that they are aligned with your child and their goals. It's, it's important, though, because I think that, that there are times where you probably as a parent wonder and it's making that decision that, yes, it's time. Um, and I like what you said about the community part of that, like when a community has come to you so there's groups of people or a few people and it just justifies it in your mind that it's probably time yeah and I think for a parent right it's really hard to like step back and say oh my gosh I think my child needs something or oh my gosh something's wrong wrong with my child which there's something wrong with your child right they just might need a different support or they might just need some different interventions that's not, they're not wrong um but I think it's hard to sometimes realize that that I need a little bit of help myself right it's okay to you know ask for help as an adult too and we have to tell ourselves that that's it's not a bad thing um asking for help is a really good thing yeah yeah, I'm sure sometimes it would feel like as a parent, like you failed your child, but yeah. really it'd be worse not to do that and get them that extra support. So. And early intervention is so important. And I don't think we like um, preach it enough, like that we need that early intervention for our kids so that they can understand themselves a little bit better. They're willing to ask for help. They get their emotions. They start learning coping strategies at these really young age, set our kids up for success as adults. And if you can kind of like flip it that way, and you can say, I'm actually helping my child to become a better adult mm -hmm. um, and take away the other thing that my child is struggling um, is always a good thing to put it in a positive spin instead of such a negative spin. Yeah, I love the projection because I, I have older kids. So looking back, I think, oh, you know, I should have thought of this a different way. Or, you know, so if you look ahead, then you're right. You're yeah. creating an adult that is sufficient, self-sufficient, or at least knows how to get help when they can't be self-sufficient. Absolutely.
Absolutely. And that's, that's what I guess we all want as parents, right? Like our children to be successful and whatever successful means to us or to them. Um, but our goal is to nurture them, to help them become growing adults and to kind of send them off as much as it's sad. And I'll probably ball my eyes out, you know, like when that totally happens. Um, but that's, that's our goal. We are making humans to be great humans. Yeah. And it's generational too, because whatever we teach them, they're going to turn around and they're going to teach their kids. What a great point, right? Like we are setting up our society for, for these types of things, if we can implement them. Absolutely. So, okay. I'm going to put you on the spot. What are three reasons that parents should have their kids create art? Oh, <laughs> a million. Um, <laughs> I guess there's so many. No time. I feel like, um, I, I know. I'm like, oh my gosh. I have. Um, first, I think that it is. It is so neglected in our education system right now. So my first thing is, if you can't do it in school, do it at home. Um, so I want that to be a reminder for parents um, that it's really great to do art at home because they don't always get it in the school system and it really feeds our soul. Um, the second thing is, is it helps us learn to self-regulate. So being with myself. The world right now is struggling at being quiet and with ourselves because of social media and the bombarding of our stuff that's always coming at us, video games, all that. So it teaches them to stop, be reflective, be quiet with themselves, making art. So I think that's just a huge thing. And the third thing is that it's fun. Um, kids need to learn that making art is actually fun and engaging and can help their brain and can help them emotionally and socially and academically so art is fun is is my third thing but I think I added a bunch of stuff into those three as much as I possibly could <laughs> that's fair that's fair <laughs> I just kept running on my sentences to kind of allow myself to say why art why every person should be making art but yeah really it is it's like you know, learning to be with yourself and love yourself. It is about fun. And it also is that we don't get it enough in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many hours in school besides that, you know, you'd almost have to go to school only for art. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, those are great reasons. And you've given us just all kinds of great information about art and the process. And I just, I just love the fact that you can take art and you can do so much with it at any level, any age, and it still is self-expression. It is still helping and serving those kids. And art's all around us from the books that we read to the magazines, to the cars, to the clothes, like I said. So just engage in art in any sort of way that you can. That is awesome. Well, thank you so much. I feel like I've used up so much of your time and yet I could talk to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much I've had so much fun I hope that everyone can kind of use this stuff to encourage some more art making either with your kids and also maybe yourself as as parents because it's a great tool to have awesome well if they wanted to contact you um is that okay yeah they can they can email me or give me a phone call I'm actually in the Chicagoland area so um have a private practice of uh, four other art therapists and myself um, and we all do art therapy with a range of people but if they have questions even just about art therapy I'd be more than happy to to help provide or or give guidance in any sort of way perfect well we'll put your information um, the information you're willing to share and, and also dandelion studios in the the links that will go with the video awesome thank you so much for your time oh thank you for yours it's been great take care you too Bye-bye.